Okay. Um, welcome all. I'm going to ask uh, Paolo to help me present um, the slide or some of our, our presentation. And then I'll also be presenting on behalf of the students that they work that they've done uh, so far. So we start with um, showing the, the course structure that we put together with the University of Catania. And I'm going to ask Paolo to help explain um, the contributions from the academics um, from the university, from the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Food. Paolo? Thank you very much. And uh, I say uh, that, um, sorry, I, I was a little bit late, but um, I was in another meeting. And uh, thanks uh, to the students for this slide, because of uh, this interaction between um, the permaculture um, uh, principles, methods, uh, and ethics uh, with the uh, seminars held by our colleagues of the department, uh, it was um, a very frequent uh, um, opportunity for uh, confrontation with the student. Um, as you know, we organized the course uh, in uh, uh, 16 uh, section of four hours and uh, except uh, the first one uh, and the last one. Uh, so for the other 14 uh, sections, so we had 14 seminars, very specific, uh, given by a uh, researcher and professor of our department in uh, 14 different topics. But what uh, impressed us very much that uh, when you go deep in one, in one subject, then uh, you can also look at the very, very strong relations and uh, scientific evidence of permaculture. So this was for, for me, and uh, I think also for Silvia and Ezio and, and, and my colleague and Ferdinando, uh, uh, was very impressive because um, uh, we had the feeling that um, two words were, were coming uh, uh, close and together and having uh, uh, the same uh, objective, the same uh, goal uh, to make a sustainable food system uh, uh, to become uh, real uh, and, uh, and uh, have the opportunity to implement uh, um, the sustainability in, in the agri-food sector. So uh, we, we found a lot of uh, uh, relationship. We try to color the, the, um, the subject uh, uh, of the seminar with the same color of the ethics and principle. Uh, uh, the idea was to draw some lines, but uh, there were too much. So it was impossible. Uh, to have a clearer look at, uh, at this uh, relationship. So I really thanks my, my colleagues because they, for, they, uh, because they did a very, uh, I think, uh, a strong effort to uh, uh, look uh, inside the permaculture. At the beginning, some of them said, uh, no, I don't believe in permaculture, and uh, like it was religion. But at the end, they were uh, very, um, very uh, motivated and interested to continue uh, and uh, to strengthen this relationship uh, uh, in, in our department. So there, there is a lot of willing from all of my colleagues to continue in this, uh, in this uh, uh, direction. And um, as uh, Ezio will tell you, we had a big opportunity to um, adopt uh, and uh, um, use uh, the principles uh, and uh, the ethics and the method of design in the farm that is uh, uh, in the side of the department. Uh, it's a, an experimental farm of a professional institute of uh, agriculture. Uh, that belongs to a um, foundation uh, whose uh, uh, goal was to uh, uh, educate the, the son of the farmers in Sicily, the poor uh, families of the farmers. So 
we, I, we think that um, our uh, idea was in line with the uh, primary goal of the foundation. And um, as, as you will see, uh, there is a, like a dream uh, um, being a reality uh, um, uh, in the um, uh, in the idea to let this uh, uh, school, uh, this uh, farm, become a center for uh, permaculture and uh, sustainability in agriculture. So I give uh, again my uh, uh, the, the speech to Ezio. Um, thank you, Paolo, for explaining what the university academics were presenting. And so they pretty much produced specialist input. But if you look at just the, the, some of the key words in the, the names of the presentation, starting from the top left, I'm just going to pick out key words. Biodiversity, sustainable management. Biodiversity, sustainable cultivation sustainable construction, sustainable innovations, um, sustainability and carbon credits, um, techniques and systems for sustainable water management, soil fertility and composting, um, sustainable management techniques, circular economy and sustainable, again, agri-food systems, sustainable principles, biodiversity, sustainable principles, uh, biodiversity again. So these are key words which are like music to any permaculturist. So the lessons that we delivered were pretty much the whole systems thinking to try and show students how these specialist lectures integrated with what we were teaching. So we started off with the origins of permaculture and, and whole systems design thinking. We introduced an emerging permaculture body of knowledge content then we spent quite a lot of time on the ethics and principles, unpacking those in, through illustrations and examples, also looking at our permaculture design processes. And then we also showcased a lot of uh, design projects just to show how from theory you can apply this to practice. And then we showed examples in theory of urban agriculture, regenerative agriculture, and permaculture solutions for climate change in agriculture and the built environment. And then we also spent a lot of time on what we could call the permaculture design studio. So in all, there were about 64 odd hours, but there was a fair amount of time that the students spent on the farm, as Paolo was saying, which is attached to the university. And there's more than 64 hours that the students um, have put in and there's still a few more hours that they need to put in to finish their design project and a little bit more. So they, they're quite dedicated to this. So we feel it's quite an interesting approach how permaculture lessons provided kind of the whole systems thinking and inter integrated with the university specialist. We're gonna reflect deeper upon this in, an, in another few slides. But at this point, I just want to briefly introduce the, um, the design that the students put together. This is kind of a work in progress of a design. It's a very nice picture done, illustration done by one of the students, uh, Vito. But he embraced everything that the student group has done so far. Um, I'm going to switch to another slideshow now to show you the work in progress of this design. So if you can just bear with me. Ezio, in the, in the meanwhile, I would like uh, to invite the student to open the camera and um, uh, say hello to everybody because uh, uh, I think uh, it's a moment uh, also to uh, celebrate uh, the, the course and uh, thanks uh, the other partners and, uh, and SAFE and uh, Antoine as the coordinator for this big opportunity we, we got uh, uh, at our department. So uh, in this moment, I see Gabriele uh, uh, Sapienza, I see Filippo Bonsignore, uh, I see Hi. Vito Fornaro with the, with the big beer, Hi. and Francesco Rizza, and then we have another big beer from uh, Orazio Fisicaro. Uh, and uh, we have still 
Luca, Luca, he wrote and uh, together with Francesco, they wrote their thesis for the, the undergraduate course on permaculture. Um, and um, we have also Luca and Pasquale that um, uh, are, are in, uh, they are eight. Uh, they were not so much students, but the group was uh, really wonderful and they, they worked uh, together and they are still working for the final evaluation that will be, um, we hope, uh, uh, in the 11 of June when uh, Ezio will be able to join us uh, at the University of Catania for the final uh, um, um, uh, pr uh, project presentation and final evaluation. And uh, we would like to organize um, also a online meeting uh, and invite some of you uh, that day uh, to celebrate together. Okay, Ezio. Thank you, Paolo. So this is the slideshow that the students have put together. We gave them a lot of support with uh, a, a typical template, um, but a lot of most of the information has come from the students, which we supported them with. And I think the students realized there's that there was a lot more than what they had anticipated, especially to coordinate all their work. So there, there's eight students, but we can also count Sylvia um, as, as a ninth student, because she is um, pretty much integrated with this whole course. Um, and here we see a nice photo of the um, foundation of Vladi Savoya, which is um, attached the academic research farm, which is attached to the university campus. Um, so this is how the students proceeded then. And, and remember, this is just a work in progress. I'll show you how far we've got and what else we still need to do. There's many, many slides in here. So I'm going to flash through a lot of them and focus on a few highlights to, just to show you the design techniques. So we gave a design brief as a typical client would do. And the, the brief there was to assess the university campus and the adjacent academic farm. So in other words, we're looking at the entirety of the campus joined up with the farm as one whole uh, permaculture project and undertake a permaculture concept design and in slideshow and poster format um, that can add value to the following key areas. The integration of the buildings with adjacent outdoor meeting spaces, an edible landscape around the edges of the buildings, integration of rainwater harvesting from rooftop and hard surfaces into the adjacent landscape, constructive critique to existing cultivation methods on the academic farm, proposals for enhancing the productive capacity of vacant areas of the academic farm, proposals for enhancing the small market of the academic farm functionally and economically, design integration amongst the design teams and presentation of design proposals to key stakeholders so that resources can be mobilized for further research and or implementation. So these are some nice photos of the, the students in action designing around the future boardroom uh, meeting room and uh, the bottom photo is the students and Paolo and Sylvia taking a, and, and the manager of the, of the uh, foundation having a tour around the farm. So that was the design brief. We then gave them a few ideas, something to look at. So the top is just the map of the whole uh, area, which we're going to unpack in a bit more detail. So you know, using pergolas, for example, to connect the buildings with the outdoor spaces, greenhouses, to, again, to connect spaces, and looking at rooftop gardens, um, how to harvest rainwater on slopes, and um, integrate stormwater drainage with the building surrounds. And then something to think about as an overstory canopy, you know, maybe palm trees or any other suitable um, tree canopy that might be um, suitable over that area. So these were just some design ideas to get the students thinking along the right channels. From here, we again unpacked the permaculture design process. Um, 
we use this design process to, to help them design the project. But knowing that it's quite a detailed process, so we, we gave them some guidance. So for example, under the stage one, the site analysis, given the time that we have available, we said, go for the 70-30 principle. Put down, assess, and analyze what information is readily available. And the information that's not read, readily available that we can do at a future time. So it's a 70-30 principle at this stage. But for stage two, let's, let's give it a, a full go there to, for a concept design. And then that's basically how far we're gonna take this project to concept design stage. But we also want to look into the future to say, what aspects of our concept design are we not too sure about that needs more detailed um, design or analysis, whatever? And there we ask the students just to make a list of what detailed design aspects should be looked at in more detail. And then for stage four, at this very preliminary stage, just to identify what is feasible in a one-year program as the next achievable steps, and just looking at a five-year vision, how do they see this project panning out? And then on stage five, if there are any obvious things that uh, can be started now that need to be operated and sustained. For example, a simple composting um, process. If there's something already evident that can be enhanced, we can already start doing something at that level. So this was the design process that they followed. And the next template starts to show how all this information was uh, put together. So for the site analysis, I'm gonna go quite quickly from here onwards. Um, this is a nice uh, ortho photo taken at a slight uh, tilt of the, the campus. So in the foreground, we see the main building. And on the back behind the building on the Northern side here is the academic farm. And the two are interrelated. That building that you saw on the cover photo of the slide is in this left-hand um, section of the farm. And then here we see a whole lot of polytunnels in the middle, another uh, building center here. There's also some tunnels that aren't in use anymore. Uh, in this area here and over here. And this set of buildings right in the center is uh, the small market, which is active uh, every week. Uh, the market opens to sell the, the vegetables that are produced on the academic farm. This is the highest point on the academic farm. It's a little hilltop. So you can see the contours go downhill. And uh, it, it, this is an, uh, a railway line at the top of the, the property boundary, and then it continues uh, uphill. You can see the steepness of the, of the contours. Mount Etna is in the distance here to the northwest. So this is a nice author photo to give you an idea of the whole site. Um, let's unpack this in more detail. Uh, this is the history of the foundation of the farm. I'm not going to go through all of this, just to say that it's been around a, two centuries, and, um, and it's still there. It used to be flourishing in a much better state maybe 40, 50 years ago. And at the moment, there are some fields that are neglected, if you, especially if you look at the, the polytunnels. So there's a lot that can be done to enhance what's already there, um, and also to um, find new markets for what has been done well there. This gives you an idea of the history of the, the area upon which the university um, campus and the farm is contained in. We're not going to delve into too much detail here, but just to show that that farm supported a lot of the, um, the families in the area, you know, on market days like they do now. And then we started looking at uh, local resources. What is available on the farm and in the area that we can make use of? So this is where the students started assessing what is there that can be used and how can we add value to it? So these were local resources. 
Um, we also have to be mindful of the local ordinances. What can we and what can't we do? So again, we've pulled out um, where we find all this uh, information. And something quite interesting came up is that an area of um, social gardens, pretty much what the, in the UK is known as the allotment gardens, or in Germany as the Schreber gardens, um, there's nine square meters per family or per inhabitant allocated in certain parks where uh, citizens could grow food. Um, we don't think that there's much evidence of, of this that is left around, um, but it can certainly be resuscitated. So here's another idea that we're keeping in the back of our minds that once this farm starts flourishing again, it can network and reach out into the suburbs and promote green spaces for these social gardens. The ordinances are already there to promote this type of initiative. The neighborhood scan, this gives us an idea of um, the locality and the extra spaces that are available. And then the, the general urban uh, development plan in that area. What is the university zoned for? What can we, what can't we do? Um, circulation, traffic, all these type of things. Um, we have to look at the, the local uh, regulations. And this is a, a interesting map about uh, contours and uh, building volumes. So it gives us an idea of the, the built environment, how it sits on the, on the landscape. Um, and then the physical attributes, what is there that we can see? And where are the areas where we need to um, pay a bit more attention to? So in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a map that shows where, the, where we've, there's evidence where the water currently flows. Um, there's utility services that have been uh, mapped here. So what the students did, there's various ways that we could have approached this uh, design process. We could have used a, a large map and overlaid it with tracing paper and, and done a lot of drawings and taken photos of the drawings and used those in the slideshow. But the students are quite tech savvy nowadays. So they went straight online on Google Earth and we showed them how to do a few things on there. Google Earth is not really the best design tool, but the beauty of it is once you design something on Google Earth, it is coordinated. So you can tilt it, you can spin it around. Those lines stay exactly where they are georeferenced. So this is the, what the students have put together. Um, they've uh, designed on Google Earth these various lines here. And we'll explain this in more detail as we go along. But um, essentially, they've marked out water flows. They've marked out uh, building areas that need to be looked at a bit more carefully. They've marked out in orange here where the solar panels are. They've marked out in purple the, the um, polytunnels that need restoration. They've also marked out the evident water flows and where we can consider um, putting some irrigation and, and so forth. Um, but they've used the tools that are available instead of um, drawing by hand, which I'm sure they can do as we can show you a nice example towards the end. So these were the physical attributes. And then the building structures. Um, so here we took some photographs of what is available and where things are located, just to give you a better idea and feel for the project. Um, the utility services, traffic and access. How do we access the site? Um, there are roads uh, right around the, the campus. Um, so these are the photos and um, access routes um, shown. And then plant species. Uh, the students made a list of um, some of the plant species they found there. We still uh, are looking at um, the, the soil uh, characteristics, but they started to, to look at the trees and hedges, what is evident, what is growing quite well. And then the cultivation systems, um, what is evident uh, at the moment? There's a lot of terraces, 
Um, there's a, a few of the professors are growing some of their research crops. Some of the polytunnels are, are quite fully operational. There's even a, a banana grove there. And so there's a lot of assets uh, on this farm, but it's quite evident that um, it can do with a, with a big uh, breath of fresh air and some design inspiration that can come from the, the permaculture students. So this is how we would then move to the next step is to start doing a sector analysis. It, it's blank here because we're encouraging students to uh, consolidate all the information they've uh, done on the sector analysis, which is shown in the, the subsequent slides. So the climate assessment, done research on the internet, and what's quite interesting is that Catania is about where you see the mouse here at the moment. And it's almost at the point where there are two biomes, two different climate um, zones. One is quite wet, moving up to the north, and a, a quite a lot drier, moving southwards. And you can also see that uh, on the map on the top right-hand corner. So it, it's at this point of interface between uh, two zones, quite interesting. This gives you an idea of all the, the rainfall um, in the past year. Um, wind sectors, we found a Windrose uh, website. You can see the dominant winds from the, the west and the east. Um, the east is, comes offshore, um, mild and humid. Um, a lot of the rainy weather, um, the rain comes from all directions and uh, Mount Etna is on the northwest up this way. And then interestingly, from the south and southeastwards, we start getting the Sirocco winds, the very hot, dry winds from North Africa. And then the sun uh, sector, the summer sun and winter sun for, for Catania. Um, and then the fire and threat sector, Threat means uh, it's more security related because there's a railway line along the top. And let's just say there's, a, there's a hunter gatherers who, two legged ones who ingress from this side and they kind of help themselves to spare vegetables when they find them. Um, there's also a bit of uh, audio pollution along the railway line. The railway line isn't uh, used intensely, it's just a single track. Um, there's sound pollution ac across the main road in front of the campus, and there's air pollution all around, primarily um, the, except the, the, the top of the site. And then the view shed from the top highest point, there's this quite a really nice panoramic view over the farm, the campus, and into the sea in the distance. So that gives you an idea of the, the panorama that needs to be preserved or enjoyed from that perspective. So that's a view shed. Right, up until this point was all uh, site analysis. Now we move on to the creative side, which is the, the design, the concept design. And how do we um, proceed on, on this note. So we start off by developing a vision statement, looking at uh, the ethics and values of uh, this type of project, and what are the overarching objectives. So the students have used um, Team Canvas here, a really nice uh, tool um, to figure out the purpose of the project, their personal goals, common goals, values, needs, expectations, a whole SWOT analysis, and, and so forth. So from this analysis, they are going to start populating um, the project vision statement and the overarching objective. So this is something that we, we're still busy with, but the template for this will start looking like in this format, where we develop a high level scope or goal. And this comes from the project purpose here. Then we've got the values, which the students have already started populating in the previous slide. And the overarching objectives, we're going to start looking at these in a bit more depth and aligning them to the permaculture ethics. And in turn, those can be aligned to the SDGs, pretty much what um, Chen Su was saying this morning. So 
the strategic approach that what we're putting together here it's called a strategic framework that can guide the project and but before you even do the design you need to have an approach what is your strategic approach why are you doing it and what are you doing so this starts to formulate the strategic approach and um, the next step we start looking at um, the design process and the first things that we look at in the scale of permanence because we use the scale of permanence to actually guide our design thinking is climate and geography and what the students have realized here is that the being on the border of these two biomes and um, there's tremendous heat in summertime so there's a there's a need to to cover the site you know put trees up have a canopy so that's what the climate is informing us the the geography i'm going through this very very quickly at this stage so the geography um is informed by the, the, the author photo map that we can see that's evident. But something interesting is the, the subterranean stream that um, goes through the, the farm. So we're gonna touch more on that just now. And now we start looking at water access and forestry and how to integrate uh, these three aspects because these give us the, um, the framework for the whole permaculture design. So what the students have done here, they've looked at water, where can we catch water and create swales and small catchment basins. So you can see here on these slopes, um, we're gonna catch the water coming down these slopes here into swales and turn them into the existing terraces that are already there. On this side as creating some swales and a small little um, catchment uh, pond here um, that can not irrigate, but can uh, make sure that the water table in the field below is, is a lot better. And then this hilltop, this is quite barren, the area behind here. But again, there's evidence if one looks across the Rawa line, there's a valley here. And um, where does the water go? And this is where we found in the center of the site here is an existing um, water uh, trough. The water flows quite strongly there. And underneath this whole system here is the underground stream that is discovered. Um, so the idea here is to capture, we know there's water up in this area, even though it looks dry at the top. But once you dig a little bit, we'll be able to, to slow down and create a little basin from which we can have swales coming around here and using the hilltop as a, as a rooftop virtually. Then something else quite interesting, alongside the roads is to create little uh, V drains on the road surface that can channel the stormwater coming down the road into these little plots alongside um, the road. Um, then we also looked at the contours and we realized that this western part of the farm here is very dry. The irrigation doesn't stretch as far as here. So the idea is there's a stream that runs pretty much all year round here, the underground stream um, that's been contained in a water pipe when it emerges at this area. And from here they, they pump the water back up to this um, a container and from there they irrigate uh, some of these terraces but we thought given the drop in these contours this is like a five meter drop so with a five meter drop you've got five bars of pressure if we put a ramp pump at the bottom here the ramp pump for every meter that of of uh, of drop is one bar you can push the water up 10 meters so this five meter drop, we can push water up 50 meters, which is more than enough to get a water feed to some existing tanks at the top of the hill here that are not being used. And from here, we can gravity feed this Western part of the farm that needs water. So that's how we closing the loop with water just by using a ram pump. And the ram pump doesn't cost anything. Uh, it uses no energy. The other opportunity for a ramp pump, um, maybe this one might need a motor, but we'll see how much the flow is. These are design details that an engineer would do. 
Um, there is a, a water channel that comes down to the bottom of the farm. When it's full, it just is lost out onto the road. We can catch this here and kill another ram pump or a normal pump. Ferdinando, could you please mute your mic? We, we can pump the water from here onto the rooftop because we're also looking at the rooftop as an opportunity as in, to, to have an urban garden. Um, alongside the, the edge, the boundaries here, we want um, hedges and then um, forest belts along the, along the contours. Um, so here again is another image showing um, uh, where we intend creating small, in this orchard area, some boomerang swales over this whole area just to slow down the rainwater some swales at the top here, and here you can see the forest belt alongside the, um, the swales. Then the buildings and fences. Uh, let's focus on the buildings. Where you see orange is the opportunity to put in um, uh, pergolas, uh, sorry, not pergolas, uh, um, greenhouses to, to extend it around the market, uh, fix the derelict greenhouses, and, but something interesting, this entrance space in front of the university here has got two small little measly palm trees. But the idea here is to enclose the space in a glass uh, greenhouse or polycarbonate um, uh, material that can create a microclimate inside here, almost like an ex external garden and, and uh, to the university campus. And this would add tremendous value to show what can be done in microclimates. Um, soils, we're still coming back to this section. The economy and energy, we're still um, coming back to this one. And now we start putting everything together. Um, we haven't quite yet delineated the permaculture zones, but this is the next immediate step so the students are actually thinking about now. So the end result of all this, in capturing this as a, as a nice sketch, um, Vito, one of our students, has actually started, because you can't really express this on, on lines on Google Earth, but you can take the Google Earth information now and you can annotate it. And this is what he's done. He's, he's shown where the trees are gonna go, where the basin uh, catchment of, of the swales, um, and so forth. Even the rooftop garden has been colored in in green. Um, so this starts to get, give you a better idea of, of how the whole design is, uh, is hung together. It's not finished by far. From here, we need to move on to the, the outputs. What are the key components? Um, so this is the framework that we're going to be using. The green are the critical success factors. And these could be, for example, uh, the rooftop garden, um, the pergolas, the, um, the irrigation scheme, um, the earthworks for the swales, uh, the food forest. So these are um, design components um, that can be unpacked with an action plan. And then a key performance indicator is how can we measure whether this component is successful or not? So it can have two, two qualities. For example, um, the urban space, we could say um, how much of it is it utilized and how much uh, food is it producing as an example. So these would be key performance indicators to measure the functionality of this plan. So we're still busy compiling this. And then ultimately we, we join it up with the strategic approach because remember, um, the vision gives us the strategic approach, whereas the critical success factors, action plans, and key performance indicators gives us the strategic methodology, the how and the when of what we do. So this pretty much takes us to the end of concept design. Uh, the way forward then, detailed design, we said just make a list of the next design elements that need to be unpacked in further detail. So for example, the RAM pumps, those need to be designed by an engineer. And that's what we list here. Um, 
the glass house, for example, an engineer or architect would design that. Then implementation, um, a very um, rough outline uh, framework for what can we do in the next five years according to these critical success factors, and then maybe a similar template for what can what is achievable in the next year ahead. So that's as far as we've taken the, the design. And we've got some comments and reflections from the students that we'd like to, to share next. So I'm going to switch back to the, the other um, slideshow, if you could bear with me. Uh, thank you, Ezio. Um, I think uh, uh, Ferdinando would like to, to say a lot to everybody because uh, his mic was uh, automatically <laughs> Uh, starting on, and uh, if the, if there are some of the students uh, uh, say goodbye and um, uh, give some reflection uh, to the to the group, uh, this is the moment. Ferdinando, please. Are uh, here in the lab for her. Um, no, just I don't know if you see the the scenario of of our work, the work of the student. Can you see? Yes. Hello? Yes, yes. Yes. Can you show the, the farm, uh, Ferdinando? Just uh... because the terrace of our... And, uh... Yeah, yeah. This is uh, the, the farm. Can you see? A little bit more. But in any case, uh, uh, but I would like to to emphasize what was said before about the integration about the, uh, among the teacher in our department to explain them that uh, permaculture is not uh, agronomic methods or techniques uh, after step by step, uh, each one uh, was very interested to contribute uh, very in a very interesting way. And uh, there are a, a very interesting pre presentation in, in the file. So, um, okay, I, I think uh, uh, the work and we can uh, uh, have a, this starting point, but of course uh, uh, we need uh, much more time to go in detail, but uh, for the moment there is a good perspective, a, a view starting point for all our work. Congratulations for all the team. Many thanks to Silvia, who was always with the student. And I, I go back, this is the, in my back, the area is next to our uh, department. So it's very interesting. I have this uh, strict relation with this uh, planning and also to interact in order to interact much more better among, uh, between uh, university and uh, they, uh, its expertise and uh, the new uh, techniques, technique with, uh, with who will uh, lead the permaculture in the future. In Thanks, uh, Ferdinando. Thank you very much also Thank for, you, Ferdinando. for have managed the, the, the Permamodel Perma project to, together with me and Silvia. And, uh, and also thanks to Ezio for the big uh, effort uh, to uh, follow the, the course uh, uh, online because of the COVID. But uh, uh, I think I'll just rush through the, the next few slides then because we've pretty much explained everything. Um, but just to say, this is a nice sketch from, from Vito. It's also showing a couple of wild design ideas in outdoor classroom, like an amphitheater. And uh, I'm sure we can combine high tech with drawing skills to enhance our, our future drawings. Anyway, moving on, these were some of the comments from the students um, during the course. Um, we'll leave these here that, so that um, everyone can, can read them at their own leisure. The slideshow has, will be shared. 
And then the reflections from Paula and myself and um, Ferdinando and Silvia, we, we pretty much given most of our feedback already, but just to something to tease out is that the permaculture whole systems thinking, what it's doing is connecting a generalist, which is what most of us permaculturists are, with I-shaped experts. And the experts are, you could say, are the, the university academics. And uh, so the, per, the permaculture students, when they come out of this course, they've got both generalists and they're also studying one or two specialist uh, themes. So they come out as T-shaped individuals. Now, T-shaped individuals with T-shaped skills are the agile thinkers of the future. So this is what we, we're hoping to um, cultivate coming out of a, a permaculture course at a university. You know, the other way of looking at it, if you get a whole group of specialists around a table, trust me, nothing will be done. At the same time, if you get a whole group of uh, generalists, again, nothing will be done. You need a combination of specialists and generalists, but you need a T-shaped person to actually lead a project. Yeah. And then something else that this has been my hobby horse for a long time is that um, for this course, um, what stood out for me is that the whole COVID thing was a, a bit of a disaster that did not allow us to interface as deeply as what we would have liked. And I think if we had spent more time together in uh, formalizing and, and structuring a, a permaculture course, we could have started developing a permaculture body of knowledge that becomes um, accepted and becomes a standard process to instill a bit of quality and, and good standards uh, for teaching permaculture at universities. And then just to wrap up here, the linkages of this project is already being proposed through an IACT project, which stands for International Active Communities in Transition. And there we are part of an Erasmus uh, funded project um, where we propose that the um, the farm, the academic farm of Ladi Savoya actually becomes an IACT center. So from there, it can, st can start promoting the whole permaculture flower uh, holistic approach um, and start teaching, as Chensi was saying, not just agriculture and backyard farming, but whole systems thinking, um, natural building, um, health and welfare, uh, holistic education, land tenure systems, and so forth. And this center can interact with all these multiple partners, NGOs, municipalities, biodistricts, agribusiness, food producers, and so forth. So that's the end of our presentation. I don't know if Paolo wants to say a few words about uh, this linkage, because um, it's quite an exciting process where we can show the next step of how we can take this project uh, further. Now, this will be the natural uh, um, outcome uh, of the PERMA module uh, uh, course uh, uh, to let the, the linkage between uh, the department and the permaculture uh, be established in a, in a continuous and uh, uh, durable uh, uh, way. So we really hope uh, to, to to find the uh, resources uh, necessary to implement the, the, the center uh, for the future projects and the future education of uh, our uh, agronomist and the food scientist. Hmm. Um, there's a good question from Pascal, which I'd like to, to answer is she's asked uh, if there's any budget constraints for the design implementation and maintenance. I said, we haven't developed those yet, um, but as we start for, uh, um, investigating the proposed um, the proposal for this IAC center, we'll also start um, getting a few estimates in and start developing a budget and, where, uh, and identifying possible funding sources as well.